In my day job working in journalism and communications, a colleague suggested that we have a company get together and she asked for volunteers to serve on either the planning committee or the cleanup committee for the event. I jumped at the chance to serve on the cleanup committee, which would be the people who would clean up, throw away dishes, cups, etc. Now, as someone who is a writer and a filmmaker and has to do a great deal of planning to produce and distribute the work I create, you would think serving on the planning committee would be right up my alley. It's actually the opposite. Because I have to do so much planning for my writing and filmmaking, I don't want to have to do even more planning in my day job or my personal life. There is so much about creative work that is theoretical. So much of it is trial and error and psychological trying to get into the mind of a potential audience member, a potential reader who will appreciate my book and anticipate the media platforms where I should try to post to reach them and how I should draft my ads to try to get them to buy my book or watch my movie. Because there is so much theoretical trial and error and planning and psychological guesswork involved in producing and marketing my creative work in quote unquote real life, I prefer to do work that has a finite beginning and ending. At this company get together for my day job, I'll be happy to serve on the cleanup committee. I'll pick up dishes and throw away cups and plates. And within a few minutes, I'll be able to see a table that is clean and clear. It's not a theory. It's not a guess. It's not trial and error. I know that if I put forth the effort, I will get a guaranteed result. Something that can eliminate the guesswork out of creating art and trying to find an audience for it is using data to make decisions. Many of us creative people are sensitive artists and we resist looking at data because oftentimes the data will hurt our feelings. For example, every day I look at social media metrics. I measure how many subscribers I have on YouTube, how many Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter slash X followers I have. And I do this because it's sort of a gauge to see if I'm being effective in promoting my work. I know it's not the end all be all because Social media metrics can be kind of fickle because people themselves can be fickle. But social media metrics are one tool to gauge whether I'm breaking through with my work and personal branding as an author and filmmaker. Now, don't get me wrong. I dread looking at this data, but there have been several instances in recent years where having this data, this daily log of social media metrics, really came in handy in situations where I had to make tough decisions. There have been a couple situations where I was indecisive, but having data to make the final decision helped me to move forward with a degree of confidence that I would not have had had I not been keeping track of this data. I'll give you a recent example. I signed on to a campaign that involved writers around the country posting content on each other's social media the concept behind this campaign was to increase engagement on each writer's social media platforms. We would all get together over a Zoom meeting and brainstorm content and then post that content on all of our social media platforms. At first, this seemed like a really fun idea. It was a way to meet and network with other writers and to come up with content that I wouldn't have come up with on my own to increase my social media following. This campaign seemed fun and worthwhile in theory, but in practice, it turned out to be different than I expected, which is often the case in life. Instead of looking forward to brainstorming with my fellow writers, I soon came to dread these meetings because invariably they would take place on a weekday and I would have to use up my lunch hour when I could have been using that time to work on my own projects. And I started to resent having to give up this block of time. And to make matters worse, a lot of the content that the other writers generated was on the edgy side because it was designed to be clickbait, trying to entice people to click on our post and engage with the content. So a lot of the writers came up with material that was borderline offensive. And since I have a day job, I feared that if some of my coworkers or heaven forbid supervisors came across this edgy content, they might be offended. I also feared that this edgy content could alienate people who have seen the documentary I directed, Lady Wrestler, about the amazing black women who integrated pro wrestling in the 1950s. I don't believe in censorship 
And the edgy content that my fellow writers came up with wasn't necessarily intended to be offensive. It was that the content could be easily misinterpreted. Making matters even worse is that I'm a chronic people pleaser. I recently wrote an in-depth medium post about being a recovering people pleaser who relapses often. And I'll put the link to that medium post in the description of this video. It soon became obvious that this social media campaign that I signed on to with other writers was just not for me and I wanted to stop. I didn't want to participate in the campaign anymore. However, being a chronic people pleaser, I didn't want to let my fellow writers down. Luckily, I had been keeping social media metrics for several years before this campaign started. So I was able to determine that the campaign was not having its intended effect. The campaign was not increasing my subscriber count or follower count on any of my social media platforms. In fact, a couple people unfollowed me during this social media campaign. I certainly can't directly attribute people unfollowing me during this campaign to the edgy content we were posting because people unfollow for a myriad of reasons or for no reason at all. People are just very fickle on social media, but rather than basing my decision to not participate in the campaign anymore on feelings, I had cold hard data to back up my decision. So that made me feel less like I was letting down my fellow writers and more like I was simply making a business decision. Another example of a recent data-driven decision that I made is that I was wondering if I should make a separate YouTube channel related to the Lady Wrestler documentary. Why did I consider splitting off the Lady Wrestler content into a separate channel? It's because on my main channel, the Chris Bornet channel, I post content related to writing, filmmaking, and pop culture commentary. This channel is geared toward people who are interested in those subjects. And while Lady Wrestler is a documentary and an independent film, a lot of people who are interested in Lady Wrestler are, by the nature of the subject matter, wrestling fans and or history buffs. So I'm well aware that people who visit my main Chris Bornet channel could be annoyed by the videos I post about any subject other than wrestling or black history. I'm an artist, what can I say? I can be wacky and offbeat and even downright silly. And while I try to be professional, my content, even though it's mainly focused around writing and filmmaking and pop culture, doesn't have one consistent theme. I'm also well aware that my channel will grow a lot faster and it would be a lot easier for me to get subscribers if I focused on a niche. But if I fell into a niche and narrowed my focus, I would not have done the Lady Wrestler documentary in the first place. It's my broad range of interests that caused me to see the significance of these women's stories and make a movie about their contributions to history. While narrowing my focus and trying to fit into a niche might result in a short-term victory in the form of more subscribers, it would not benefit me in the long run. So niche, please. But seriously, folks, once again, data helped me decide that it didn't make sense to go to all the time and effort of making a separate Lady Wrestler channel. When I first started this channel a few years ago, I was almost exclusively posting content about the history of wrestling and the stories of these fierce, brave African-American women. And while there seems to be an ongoing demand for content related to the women, and rightfully so, the data indicated that when I was only posting content about the lady wrestlers, my channel's subscriber count was not increasing by leaps and bounds. Some of the individual videos about the lady wrestlers would get a high number of views, but the videos were not increasing the overall subscriber count of the channel. So analyzing the data led me to believe that if I made a separate lady wrestler channel, certain videos might have a high number of views, but the channel itself wouldn't have a high subscriber count. Keeping track of data is hard because oftentimes the data shows that despite the fact that we content creators put a lot of time and effort and pour our hearts and souls into projects, a lot of times the content just doesn't get the engagement or the reach that we hope for. However, having this data is invaluable when making decisions, especially when you're on the fence when you're indecisive about something, you could go one way or another with making a decision. And having this data could well be the deciding factor in a lot of cases. Let me be clear, 
even if you do use data to make decisions, it's still going to be an uphill battle for us creatives to market and distribute our work and find a sizable, appreciative audience. But by making data-driven decisions, it can maybe make that uphill battle a little less steep. If you like this video, please leave a comment, share it, and subscribe to my channel.